episode number 179. But I'll tell you that in my experience, if you're very, very good at Facebook, you're not going to be that great at Google and vice versa. Welcome to the Be Real Show with Travis Tutal and Hoff, where we talk about life, dreams, social media, and business. Well, hello and welcome to the Be Real Show with Travis Tutal and Huff. Folks, I'm fired up today. And if after this show, you might actually even have better converting Facebook and Instagram ads, as well as we're going to get into the mind of our featured guest, Casey Carroll. Casey, are you ready to be real? More than anything else in the world, let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> Casey specializes in sales, 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 folks, and knowing where your sales come from, which is obviously most of us, uh, as long as you don't know where our sales come from. So uh, we're going to get into that. Also, understanding Facebook ads. And now, more than ever, probably, Instagram ads and all the things and fun things you can do with Instagram ads. Uh, and he is the founder of Action Advertising Agency. And my man is out there. So I really appreciate you having him on the show today. How's your day going today, Casey? You know what? In the Northwest, we don't really get a whole lot of nice days. But man, let me tell you, it is a beautiful day outside with no rain, which is a rarity. So I'm definitely soaking it up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So yeah. t tell me about this because I looked into your profile around three years ago or so. You started the Action Advertising Agency. Yep, yep. And uh, helping businesses and brands and, and uh, folks that are doing ads understand and, and essentially giving them the strategies to make better buys right on their advertising. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, you know, what's really interesting is that it, this was actually kind of something that I stumbled into because at the time I was actually in a couple other businesses and, um, you know, I could go through the whole like story about all the other businesses I've had that have failed or didn't do that well, but I'll kind of, um, I'll keep it a little bit more bridged. You know, at the time I was actually thinking about getting my MBA and going back into, you know, maybe even a professional salesperson or managing a sales team or something like that. But instead, I kind of just followed my gut instinct and went in direction of, of uh, advertising because I actually happened to see some Facebook ads. I know, crazy, right? Uh, that, that were promoting courses and stuff. And so I'm like, you know what? I wonder if I would actually be really good at this because I can tell you that my past experience working for other people, I hated it. It was like, mm -hmm. it was a nightmare working, waking up every day just having to deal with bosses I thought that were incompetent and all these other, you know, stupid corporate initiatives that made no sense. And I was never a Kool-Aid drinking dude. I, I tend to be kind of oppositional to authority figures. <laughs> so, um, so I decided to give this a shot. And um, in, the, in the very beginning, it was actually a, a struggle. It was tough because it's kind of like, you know, learning a brand new language all over again or learning a new instrument, you know, uh, right. it's, it, it's, you're going to suck before you actually get really good at it. And uh, I, I always kind of wondered, hey, look, you know, I got a sales background. I got a marketing background. I think if you really know how to sell stuff to people, you're actually kind of a natural advertiser because it's all about, you know, behavior and understanding why people buy or why they do certain things and, and really truly, you know, loving that process of learning more about humanity and what will pull triggers and such. Uh, and so because I had a lot of that, that really solid sales background, um, you know, graduated from Washington State with a professional sales certificate. Uh, in fact, I also went to the National Collegiate Sales Competition and represented oh, nice. Washington State University back in 2008. So I had a lot of like, you know, I've done a ton of sales stuff, in other words. And, uh, and I, I realized I was actually a pretty natural fit in being a good advertiser after I really sucked in the beginning. And uh, the rest is history. <laughs> wow. So now when you uh, help clients, uh, mm -hmm. what, what kind of businesses do you typically help? Small and medium sized businesses that are they're working on their own ads internally? Yeah. And they need someone to really help guide them to better conversions, better engagements. Yes uh, and no, actually. Okay. So so I, I do I have kind of niched uh, niched down quite a bit into uh, you know, medical related niches, and then also brick and mortar retail locations that that also do you know digital advertising and also have a physical location. So, uh, like auto dealers, for example, is, is is a prime example of that. But what I do with each client really kind of depends because you you can kind of put businesses in a couple of different buckets. Uh, there's businesses that have a traffic problem and then also have a conversion problem. Mm. Uh, and and the conversion problem itself is is a sales process. In fact, I would tell you that in most in, in most scenarios, most smaller businesses are not really suited to actually start running advertising in the beginning because, and, and if this is a common thing you've, ever, you've either said to yourself or heard before in the past, people were listening to this, uh, and if you said to yourself, man, these leads suck. If you've ever heard something like that, uh, the reality is the sales process it actually sucks. <laughs> and, right. and it takes 
a little bit of, you know, an outside eye to be able to say, oh, okay, well, you have to sell differently. Like, and obviously a referral doesn't sell the same way as a, 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 a cold traffic customer. There's, there's, there's more of a needs identification process. You need to be able to ask different questions and all that sort of stuff. Um, so some clients need both in, in the process. Some of them actually have a super solid sales background in which I'm purely just um, spending all my time focusing on improving results from the advertising perspective. Mm-hmm. And then there's, there's other consulting clients that are kind of in that third bucket that are not necessarily kind of like in between in those two. Um, and that might be, you know, maybe helping set up with offline event, you know, set up data, uh, uh, Facebook attribution, um, you know, optimization from the ad account perspective. Perspective and, and looking at certain things that, uh, that that are important towards the overall sales goals, um, and and also you know trying to also take a look at things from a holistic perspective. So like you know a lot of my peers, uh, they will you know focus on purely just driving the lowest cost of leads possible. But I found that in some scenarios it actually makes a lot of sense to add friction to the opt-in process, um, you know by changing a lot of different things, etc., to produce more conversions and. Uh, and that's really what matters. I mean, look, cost per acquisition is the only thing that matters in advertising. If you if you think anything else, you're lying to yourself. It is not cost per lead. It's not cost per click. It's all that other stuff is implied. But you know, you can't pay your bills with clicks and impressions and reach and all these other metrics that 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 you know that may eventually lead towards a conversion or someone buying something. But really, look people buying stuff is really the only thing that matters. You know, you're looking for a return on your money if you're advertising. And so I, I, I cut straight to what matters. And if that means we pay more per lead, but we get a lower cost per acquisition, I'm okay with that. Right. And I think we all have to, we need, we need to change the narrative on what we're really actually accomplishing in the digital advertising world to not just be clicks and all that other garbage. It needs right. to be cost per acquisition. Only thing that matters. Right. And so can you uh, line out simply or maybe quickly how a cost uh, per acquisition campaign would start with someone had like a lead form on their website? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk, actually, I think it's a natural segue to talk a little about offline events. And, and I'll kind of tell you a bit, of, a bit of a story. So a couple of years ago when I was working, uh, you know, with, with my, uh, you know, my, my partner company, we have a joint venture that we do all automotive stuff with. They were running a lot of brand awareness ads and they're a creative agency. And so they were like, hey, Casey, is, is there any way that we could like maybe figure out a return on investment for a brand awareness ad? And I thought he was smoking crack. And I was like, dude, there's no way. I mean, what are you talking about? There's no way you can, you can prove, you know, there's no call to action. I can't track a lead. Like, right. come on, dude, you're, you're, you're smoking. You're, you're, you're ridiculous. Um, but I did research and I, and I kept doing more research. I actually spent a lot of time on, on like seeing if there is a way to crack this code because I, I was sure that there had to be, right? Uh, and that's when I stumbled across Facebook offline events. So with Facebook offline events, what it will allow you to do is it'll allow you to actually uh, have Facebook keep track of every single person who has either seen or clicked on your ad up to 28 days afterwards. And then if someone buys up to 28 days after the last time they saw a specific ad or clicked on a specific ad, you can actually upload your sales data from, from a, like a brick and mortar physical location, like a, like an auto dealership, for example, you can upload all that sales data and then you can push that into your, your Facebook ads manager view, and then you, you can know exactly which specific ads someone decided to walk into a, a physical location and, and buy, even if there was no call to action on the ad and it was a brand awareness ad. Wow. So, so it's, it's crazy what we can do with technology nowadays. I mean, the, in the past, it's kind of like, hey, I run a radio ad and I might get an increase in sales. But wouldn't it be really nice to know which specific radio spot on which specific channel at which specific time at which gender and which offer you're offering that really drove that outcome? You can't do that with radio. There's no right. way. You know? Right. But you can with Facebook. And so it's crazy how much data we get. And so when I create a, when I look at things like cost per acquisition, what I can do because of my using tools like offline events, what I can do is I can, I can bring all that sales data back into, you know, the ads manager view. And for example, with just one dealership last year alone, um, you know, I, I drove, I think over 1180 different ad sets over the course of the entire year, testing different models, different offers, different creative, different brand awareness slash engagement posts, doing, uh, you know, really polished videos versus really authentic looking videos, pictures of people who were like, you know, standing in front of their car that the dealership took that we wanted to, to push out and see if people saw that and wanted to come buy from that dealership afterwards as a result of that sort of stuff. Um, and, and as a result, you know, little by little over time, you know, we're seeing a 12 to one, you know, return on ad spend on profit, not on revenue, but, but actual profit. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, and and we can track those profit numbers. I don't track revenue with, with vehicle sales because, you know, if you sell a 30 or $40,000 vehicle, that's great, but how much was profit? Um, and that's where, you know, we can actually dig into the, um, the the gross profit, you know, front plus back, uh, profit that a dealership would make in that scenario. And then we can make decisions based off of trends and data on what's actually driving sales and profit, not leads. And it allows me to then have a completely different perspective on what I'm trying to accomplish and and we've seen that over time you know we can improve the the return on investment that you get which then allows you to put more money back into the platform and then to be able to maximize it because of the strength of being able to measure your ads not based on just cost per lead cost per click and impressions anymore now we we can just not even focus on that stuff and just run ads that are have a proven track record of actually driving a sale even if there was no call to action on that ad wow that's a that's awesome. I'm gonna cool have to stuff. check that out too. Take <laughs> offline events. Yes. Now on Instagram because Instagram is now the hot platform for mm-hmm. people to start advertising in. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing there's a certain type of ad that's working well on on Instagram? Or is it just kind of a variety of them? I mean, there's the stories, there's the yeah. regular ads. There's I've I've heard more and more in getting into shopping and making it easy to, for people to shop on your Instagram. Yeah. You know what's really funny? I bought my wedding ring off an Instagram ad. Oh, I'm not wow. no kidding. <laughs> I really wow. did. Yeah. And so, well, I mean, I get, hey, I guess it depends on the gender. You have been looking already, though. You have been <laughs> looking already. It wasn't just, but, but, you, but you're in the market. So you literally yeah. bought a ring off of Instagram. That's just shows right there. Yeah. Yeah. I've also bought, um, I've bought, like uh, toys I thought were kind of unique and interesting. I've bought shoes, I think, off of Instagram ads. My wife has bought clothes. Uh, I've, I've actually bought a lot of stuff off of Instagram. Um, and, and I guess, Hey, look, if you're a guy, you know, if put in, put a butt in your Instagram post and then you'll probably sell something. I'm, I'm kidding. Don't do that. All right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook will actually not have a, be very fond of that one. No, not at all. Um, but, uh, in fact, I also bought a carbon fiber ukulele off of Instagram that I learned about on, uh, because of it. Side note. Anyways. Oh. Um, so, so here's the thing. Instagram is a very different platform than Facebook. If you run your Facebook ads on Instagram without any changes whatsoever, either in the creative or the messaging or the offer or anything, if you just do that exact same thing, you are bound to fail on Instagram as an advertiser. So do not treat Instagram as the same platform as Facebook. They're very different. Gotcha. With that said too, look, you have to test stuff to really kind of get a good understanding of what's going to work really well for a specific product or niche or service or, or vertical or whatever. So, you know, for example, square, uh, square images or square video do very, very well. Uh, on Facebook, you've got the luxury of also having a much larger spot to talk about the headline, to talk about, you know, you can highlight the offer in the headline. Uh, you know, the copy doesn't necessarily, the copy has to change on, on Instagram. So it really depends. I mean, like you can maximize for each gender, for each age group, for each interest or category that you're producing. You can kind of maximize like the right combination, and the right blend between creative copy offer and also um, you know, placement on, on Instagram, but it takes a lot of testing. So, uh, so the, the hotness for, for those who are kind of like wondering, you know, tips and tricks, what I would really recommend is getting very comfortable with testing stuff with, with lower budgets. Uh, right. You can do things with campaign budget optimization and then Facebook will actually place, you know, those ads directly in front of, uh, you could create like, you know, 40 or 50 different ads in, in, a, in a campaign and then just test them all separately or test them all at the same time and let Facebook decide who to show them to. And, and they're usually pretty good at, at helping you find them once you have enough data to, to figure out, uh, you know, who to show those, those audiences to. And that doesn't even talk about the additional conversion, you know, campaigns that you can run that, for example, like, you know, if you've got a lot of, of data that you fed your Facebook pixel, which the Facebook pixel, for those who don't know, is is a piece of JavaScript that actually goes along your entire website, funnel process, et cetera. You can use it for um, you know, retargeting campaigns and building audiences on that sort of stuff. But the pixel data also is a lot smarter than that. So for example, if you've got the purchase event code on an e-commerce um, uh, you know, kind of a funnel or something like that, with the moment that someone makes it to the very final thank you page after they've paid after they whatever. And if you put the purchase event code on the Facebook pixel, that's actually on that particular page, what it will do is it'll find, uh, it'll keep track of every single person who has became a purchase that, that, Hey, your Facebook profile shows you like these, these things. And Facebook has 17 different, 17,000 different data points that they use to convert us into an algorithm, a mathematical equation. And so what you can do 
is Facebook will actually start to look at all the people who went to that thank you page as a purchase and it will find more people just like those. It'll find other people that match that same algorithm of 17,000 different data points. So then you get the right blend of people who are likely to buy your product, people who, uh, you know, and that's why when people, by the way, when people think that Facebook is listening to you, they do not access your microphone like that. Everyone thinks that, but I've had some really scary moments where I was dealing with, with, with someone who talked about something. And then I also then started to see those ads on my Facebook feed. I'm like, wait a minute, how yeah. did this happen? I've this been is doing cool. that on Instagram, man. I swear. I swear. I've heard yeah. it from some crazy stuff, situations in yeah. the last like a few months that were yeah. like, people were saying something that's like not even anything they've ever searched for on yeah. And all of a sudden it popped up on their Instagram. I mean, my wife has have had it happen to us many a time now for like multiple years. She'd be, I remember uh, we were in Vegas one time at the, at the airport there ready to roll on. She's like, I think I want a Starbucks this. And all of a sudden, in like 30 seconds, this thing popped up on her Instagram. It was like, holy crap. Yeah, There's something to it. There's something to it. I don't know exactly what they're doing, but. I can explain some of it too, actually. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you with, with 17 different th thousand different data points, they will look at the things you comment to other people. They, they are almost, you know, using artificial intelligence, it's almost scary how accurate they can get in predicting behavior. Like um, a couple, a couple of years ago, I think I, um, I falsely actually said this was Facebook that did this um, in a previous podcast on a different podcast, but it actually turns out it was target that did this um, a couple of years ago. Target was in the news because based on, on analyzing shopping purchase behavior, uh, they were able to predict that a woman was pregnant before she even knew. And that, wow. and they started serving her, you know, maternity based ads and, and wow. pregnancy based ads and all that sort of stuff. I think I heard and, this story too. Right. And this is a couple of years ago. Right? And, right. and all they had to do was analyze shopping data right. because big data can predict us a lot more than you predict. think. Right. That, that, that you can. And so, for example, in a scenario where, hey, someone talked about this and then it showed up in a certain feed or, you know, or, or maybe you saw something along the lines after the fact, even though you personally never searched anything whatsoever. Well, here's what Facebook does have. Facebook has IP address data. If they're finding that you were talking next to your friend, they already know your phone's IP address. You're standing right next to that person. If that person had searched or liked or commented or anything like that related to that word and it was next to you at the same exact time, right. Facebook might use that, that data to then say, oh, maybe there's a likelihood that this person might also want to see this because That's I saw that they were also at a Starbucks location with their IP address like a week ago. So let's show that Starbucks ad to them at the same time and see what happens. And this is all happening instantly, all the time. They're their targeting algorithm is so incredibly strong and powerful. When, when it turns you into an algorithm, if, it, if, it, if you match up with an audience, it's turned into a purchase on a, on a page somewhere else. They, they monitor dwell time. They, man, they monitor IP addresses. They monitor you know, all of the, the people that you associate with, the people that you like, et cetera. And, and granted, you know, obviously privacy is a huge deal nowadays, but, but you know, the, the world of getting very very, you know, customized data that is very specific to you because of it, because it knows you better than you even know yourself is the reason why Facebook, you know, is, is one of the most dominant and valuable advertising platforms in the entire world. Oh yeah. The best, Crazy, buy, huh? the best buy for your money, baby. <laughs> but best buy for your money. I've been saying that for many years now. Oh yeah. I started oh, yeah. 10 years ago. I mean, I used to say that was during the heydays when it was, things were very little cheap. Oh yeah. Real we were cheap. Like, like real cheap for Facebook. cost per click in the pennies. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, you could yeah. get page likes for like a literally a penny for like a page like conversion on a Crazy. worldwide audience on a worldwide audience. Um, you know, there was some weird stuff that would show up in there here and there, but a lot of it was really realistic, you know, but now it's just the cost obviously because so many people want to advertise. And here, here's the thing too. It still is a very, very valuable platform. I mean, the way that I look at it is like this, you know, you, when you look at your entire advertising, uh, you know, marketing wheel, there is a lot of things that go into that, that you're not really necessarily sure if the relationship between each other is producing, like which one's better at top of funnel, which one's better at bottom of funnel, which one is great at creating awareness, but not necessarily great at driving leads on the site or eventually conversion or eventually purchases. Uh, we can, we can, we can understand the contextualized differences between each advertising platform, like for example, you know, using using a tool called Facebook Attribution, uh, you can actually see which platform is great at creating top of funnel awareness and which one is actually really good at creating bottom of funnel conversions. So, to give you an example of that, um, we learned not too long ago for one of our dealerships that Facebook is an absolute mon monster at creating top of funnel awareness. 
So I'm running ads, model specific stuff to these, these individuals, but they might not necessarily want to go to the website and actually shop at that moment. So I can see that, you know, maybe up to 28 days later, they'll go to the website. Well, actually what they'll do is they'll Google the, the name of the business. They will see a Google AdWords ad that says that name, click on that because that's the first thing they see, go to the website, create a conversion, and then actually buy a vehicle within 28 days. Wow. So I can see the, the contextualized relationship between Google and Facebook and also other paid platforms like uh, you know, uh, native advertising platforms like Taboola and Outbrain and you know, maybe Yahoo Gemini. Or if you want to see the, the relationship between Google My Business and conversions, whether they're greater at top, of, top or bottom of funnel, you know, you can really see that difference. And so it allows us as advertisers to then spend our money from and look at our marketing wheel rather than individual digital silos like Facebook and Google being different platforms. Right. Instead, what we can do is we can say, look, if we know that Google's really good at creating the bottom funnel conversions better than Facebook is, but Facebook's much better at getting people aware and interested. Right. And- you know, in the platform and then maybe even trusting the business because they're seeing happy pictures of people, you know, standing in front of their vehicles from the dealership and stuff. Absolutely. And running ads to those to try to convert them later on for, for example. And if, and if I'm not, if I'm getting people to that last mile, but Google converts, what you should do is spend more money maybe on your Google search or uh, Google AdWords campaigns for bottom of funnel right. and spend more of your money on Facebook for the top and middle because it's, it's a better advertising allocation for your money in that way, you know? Right. So these are, these are the things we can do now. Um, these are the things where no longer do digital platforms have to be in a silo. We can play nicely. Facebook can play nicely with Google now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think they do business together too on a wholesale level too, don't they? They do some business together, I think. I, I think they might. But I think, you know, from the advertisers that I talk to, you know, here's what I found. People who are really good at Facebook, for example, I mean, I, I don't like to use the word expert. I'm not going to use it in this scenario. But I will say that I, I'm, I'm pretty darn decent at Facebook. Right. Uh, and I think it's, it's obviously run a few campaigns. My man has run a few thousands of thousands, a few 10,000 campaigns at least. Yes. I've, I've, I've spent a decent amount of money on Facebook. So I, <laughs> so I understand it very well. And it's, it's also the only platform that I've really focused all my energy on. I've tried doing some Google stuff, but I'll tell you that in my experience, if you're very, very good at Facebook, you're not going to be that great at Google and vice versa. Right. So I think sometimes some advertising agencies pitch either Google or Facebook as like, the only platform to focus on the best thing since sliced bread and, and, the, and, and that they can do it all for you. If you come across an agency that says they can run Facebook and also Google ads at the same time with equal efficiency and skill, they are lying to you. It is not possible. There's no way you can keep up with all the changes on the Facebook platform and Google and still be very, very good in the process. It, you'll be pretty good at both, or you might be better at one, but kind of okay at the other. But, but the reality is, look, both platforms have their merit. Both platforms have their strengths and weaknesses. What right. you should do is hire the best person for, for each platform right. and just make sure that they play nicely together and that they understand that I'm feeding Google's bottom of funnel conversion campaigns and I'm okay right. with that. And, and Google is doing a good job at converting the traffic that I'm creating that I'm struggling to create because maybe the platform is not the right one for that sort of stuff. Right. So they finally get interested and they type it in, like you said, in a Google search and bingo. then boom. Yep, exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think the days of, of like, you know, advertising companies just positioning themselves as the, as like the only platform to focus on, or you should only be doing Google or whatever, like, come on, dude, that's, that's just not really how it works. And, right. and if, if you're, if your if your digital advertising isn't looked at from a holistic perspective from the top down, um, then you're guilty of also, you know, not really giving the, the right kind of attention to digital to make it work. I agree, man. And uh, I hope everyone's ready to get serious and get real because we're about to take you, my man, into our top 10. Are you ready? Woo! Let's Let's do do this. (laughs) Hot sauce. Put some hot sauce on it. Apple or Android? Ooh, I used to be an Android. Oh, so I worked for the wireless world back in the day and I used to have like nothing but droids for a very long time. And I have switched over to Apple ever since 2016 and I have never looked back. So I'm an Apple guy now. Apple, Netflix or YouTube? Netflix for sure. I'm sorry. Their, their content that they produce is just outrageous. You know, like oh, I, geez. I like YouTube. Don't get me wrong, but, but Netflix, I mean, come on, uh, you, there's, there's no comparison. <laughs> Literally you could just go, uh, you know, escape in an adventure. You don't even know what's going to happen. You're just like, oh. an adventure. There's so many dang content. Totally. You can watch like, like black mirror, for example, like, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of black mirror. That is such a, I mean, their original content's just out of control, man. You know, like I've, I, I watch Jessica Jones. I watch all of the super, you know, superhero stuff on, on Netflix. And there's always new content they're producing 
all the time, including right. Sandra Bullock movies. I didn't even know like oh, Netflix know, yeah. feature films and stuff. It's crazy. And also Stranger yeah. Things. I mean, come on. You, you, yeah. If you think, if you think, you know, YouTube, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. I think YouTube is just used a little differently. Like you totally. said, you know, it's just used a little different Instagram or Twitter. I'm not really much of a Twitter guy, so I've got to be Instagram for sure. IG, yeah. IG. Chicken, steak, yeah. or fish? Oh, man, that's tough. Can I say all three? <laughs> all three, yeah. A combo plate. I like your style. I like your style. <laughs> a combination. A laptop or an iPhone? Oh, that's uh, – they're used differently, right? Definitely. So, I mean – um, I mean, that's like apples and oranges in my opinion. So I have a desktop that I would do all my work. In fact, I've got like a 44 inch monitor that I do. Oh, all yeah. work Hammer, stuff. Hammer, yeah. yeah. Nothing like a desktop. Oh yeah. Desktops. Yeah. Totally different. But like if I had to pick between a laptop or, or an iPhone to work, I mean, I use them differently, but I would definitely pick laptop. Laptop. Yeah. There's nothing, there's still nothing like it. Even though the the apps have just gotten a lot better on these phones now, it's amazing. I think people also tried to like make a switch from, from laptops to iPads at one point and Dude, there's, I just don't see how you can actually do that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Unless, I mean, the iPad is just such a, it's like great when you're on the airplane or something like that. And yeah. You're just browsing and clicking and watching videos, but it's not yeah. efficient for work. I mean, it really isn't even for good for responding on email. <laughs> no. In fact, you know, I made the mistake of getting the iPad Pro and I, or the 12 inch one too. I, immediately regretted it the moment I got it because I was used to having like a 9.7 inch iPad where I can just walk around the house and, and just watch videos or do whatever I wanted to at any point in time. But man, this is like behemoth. Right. If, if you drop this on your foot, you'd be getting foot surgery because you have a, a toe, a toe gone. <laughs> it would get severed, man. That thing is heavy as hell. And, and I'm like, why the hell did I get this thing? I don't, it's, it's a waste of my, it was a waste of my money. And now I want to go back to a smaller iPad. So, you know, Hey, <laughs> note to self don't get the 12 inch ipad pro it's a waste of money <laughs> go for the small go for the small ones uh, go for the small ones uh, steve more, jobs is right more economical but also lighter yeah exactly won't break your foot as much maybe gonna, slightly fractured gonna but, take yeah. a toe out right. spotify or pandora uh i'm old school man actually it's, <laughs> it's pandora and here's a reason here's a funny story about pandora so uh, the other day I was listening to Bruno Mars on Pandora because, you know, Hey, I've j I just stick with what's really worked for me. Sure. And all of a sudden the dreaded band Nickelback comes on. Wow. Yeah. And I was just immediately disgusted and wanted to throw my computer at the door. Like, how dare you put Nickelback on my Bruno Mars channel? But I, I posted about that on Facebook and my friends all made fun of me for like, wait a minute, you still use Pandora. <laughs> I, and I guess I, I'm old school. Yeah. I, I still use it. It works for me. So, you know, make fun of me all you want, but uh, you know, Hey, I pay 50 bucks a year for premium and it works really well. So, Oh yeah. It's a great value. And also, yeah, it's fun to just kind of not have to worry about what exactly is coming up next. They just throw totally. a mix into you. Totally. Spotify is getting better with the playlist though. So I'll tell you that that's how they're kind of come back at a, you know, you, you pick a vibe and then, then, you know, it just takes you on a journey. I would uh, say Spotify is almost kind of like Apple music though. Kind of right. I mean, it is, it is, it is. They've just really done a good job with the playlist. I think that's the mm -hmm. key thing that separates Spotify yeah. And then like they have a new discovery playlist or they'll have a new music Friday playlist, new dance music Friday. They'll have release radar where they're doing different remixes coming out all the time. Yeah. And so like you're just able to kind of uh, uh, absorb what's currently being produced. And then also if you just want to go like weekend vibes, you know, it's going to take you on to some kind of like weekend more chill. Uh, I think they've really maximized that part of it. Mm -hmm. Or obviously if you just want to listen to the whole, uh, you know, album, you know, of an yeah. artist. But I think they've really done a great job better than anyone. And I think that's why they're so successful is the playlist. I really got to give Spotify a shot because I know some Spotify diehards that just like swear by it. And I've just yeah. been so, super old school like, hey, I've got XM radio. I think people make fun of me for even having XM radio. But I'm like, yeah, yeah I got XM radio. Um, but yeah. <laughs> well, they do a good job on XM too. It's, it's hard to go. So XM does a really good job. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, they've done it. I think Spotify is, is making huge leaps into playlisting. And I think that's what there's that, that's taken them to the next level. Uh, I think Spotify is also launching a podcast. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. New shows on Spotify, actually, folks. Woo! I just wanted to know. <laughs> Movies or video games? Movies, for sure. I mean, well, let me give you some context. If uh, So... I, I used to play video games religiously back in the day. And man, like I, I had halo parties where I would stay up, you know, oh, with my friends really? in high school. Oh yeah. Like connecting via an actual like land port and stuff like that with someone else in another room. Like someone's looking at your screen and stuff. So I, I did video games forever. And then I met, you know, the love of my life and yes. realized that uh, if I wanted to keep her around, I probably wouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't play video games anymore. Uh, and so I stopped playing video games probably like in my late twenties and also just realized I'm like, Oh my God, like when I looked at call of duty, I would over the course of like a couple months, 
spend like literally days right <laughs> playing playing video games like literally for like like 48 to 50 hours of actual time in the course of a couple of months and i'm like whoa that's not making me money i should be doing something else with that time instead <laughs> and with movies it's like it's like you you know watch a few movies a week or whatever and it's not like you're so there's an end there's, there's an, end. an end to it versus video games it's like you know I, I feel like video games are just like the ultimate addiction machine oh dude yeah because they're just geared towards like hey by the way we've got new upgrades or like right. You've right. got new new, new packs, worlds. a new world that we just new create. worlds, new <laughs> new downloads. Hey, you want to get this new you know custom weapon or something like that? Or hey, you want to you want to improve your uh, your your rankings in, in the world for this you know battle match type stuff? Uh, yeah, I never got into. I, in fact, I got out of video games before Player on Battleground, and then also right. well, um, it all like, kind of went to the cloud in a way. Yeah, it really did, and and I got out of it before that happened, which I'm. I'm grateful. At least, probably my bank is probably more the most grateful of it because because yes. I'm 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 actually being at least somewhat more productive with my time. But but yeah, I mean like anything where it has like like there's no end point to it, like a video game, for example. It's I, I just find that I get too addictive to it and I just get sucked into it. And it's almost like I'd rather just try to do the, have the discipline of not only keeping my my marriage happy with my wife right. and not spending all my time on video games instead of hanging out with her or whatever uh but also you know not getting not even getting tempted to even want to get involved in that world again because I, I know i'm gonna get lost into it and it's gonna suck right i don't think you are brother i think you're gonna be productive <laughs> and you're not gonna have to worry about it uh, yeah. reading books or listening to books Oh man, this is so tough because I would tell you that uh, I'm way too ADHD to to, to even read books, <laughs> but I still do. Um, so I, I read books only when I fly though, if I feel like, and, and I specifically hold books and I try to find places to fly so I can read because that's like the only way I can actually be able to pay attention enough and not get distracted by everything else that's going on in my life is if I'm forced to sit down in, in a and a tube that's going 500 miles an hour with a bunch of strangers where I have nothing else to do except for read. So I read when I'm flying, but I've never really got into listening to books because like I, I work from home and I have my home office. I almost got, you know, a team in the Philippines as well for, um, for my company and stuff. But if I try to like write an email and listen to an ebook at the same time, I'm doing neither one of them very well. Right. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I'd like to get into audiobooks. A lot of my, you know, if you commute, if you travel, like since I don't commute, you know, I, I don't, I, there's, it doesn't really benefit me to get into audiobooks, but yeah, I would definitely go with reading instead of audio. Totally. Yeah, there's nothing like a good book. So stocks, oh, yeah. crypto, or real estate? Ooh, real estate. Um, yeah. So I, I used to be a Bitcoin miner at one point. I actually spent like 20 grand on Bitcoin mining equipment back in like 2015, 16. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, I was like, and I had free like, sorry, what? Did you make some dough? I, I was lucky to break even, but here's the frustrating part. Like, so at the time I, I sold all my Bitcoin holdings between like 250 to 500 bucks or so. Yeah. And then like two years later out of nowhere, it suddenly was worth $18,000. Right. Uh, and so I would have actually been a millionaire if I just held on to my Bitcoin instead of selling it. But I sold it to pay back my credit cards, which I put all those Bitcoin miners on. So I could, you know, um, so I could, you know, just try the operations or whatever. So uh, crypto is just, it's way too volatile. I, I, I've made money in crypto, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, I've had Bitcoin I forgot about that all of a sudden accumulated a bunch of money and then I found yeah, it. Yeah, there you go. I got money. Cash, big quick cash. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, like, uh, so I've, I've had that happen to me and I've, so I've made decent money. But for me, you know, like I, I actually used to be a real estate flipper. And so I understand real estate very well, but also I understand market timing and market cycles. And so I got out of real estate back in 2016 because um, I used to actually flip rent to own properties. And I did like 75 of them in like 10 different states, um, but kind of got sick of it. And so I want to go back into buying properties again, but I'm waiting for motivation. And to be real, I mean, until there is a, a strong, uh, you know, buyer's market where there's right. more inventory and there's, you know, less avenues for people to sell, there's, there's not many opportunities for creative investors like myself. So, but you know, back in 2014, um, I did buy a house with no money down. I took over payments. It's called a subject to transaction um, where you take the property subject to the existing liens, encumbrances and loans and all that stuff. And uh, so I had built in financing and uh, you know, I've, I've been renting it out since 2014. It's gotten oh, like awesome. five or 600 bucks a month in cash flow, and it's appreciated and, and, and zero money down too, which is great, but it's appreciated, I think like $200,000 since awesome, that point. Brother. And, and so like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in love with real estate. And also, I, you know, I bought my first house when I was 20. I still live in that house. I've been remodeling it, but we're going to be looking to um, probably buy a bigger home and start a family, you know, in the next like two or three years or so uh, when the market hopefully starts to slow down even more. But, right. but um, 
uh, we're going to turn this into a rental forever too. I mean, the cash flow would be very, very attractive. And uh, it's, it's hard to kind of turn down, you know, an asset that you can depreciate on your taxes where you make money, appreciate over time where you'll get, you know, li uh, not li liquidity, but at least equity right. and also potentially cash flowing. You, you profit three ways with real estate. So it's a no brainer in my opinion. Yeah. I was my, one of my, one of my good clients, he's always says, I got, you know, X amount of families out working for me to go pay my, you know, cause he owns about 16 homes. Nice. As he does rentals on and he's a, he's just a smart guy. And he's always like, right. They all go to work and they're, you know, they're working to, you know, then come back and pay for the house. And, uh, so it's just an interesting way of thinking about it. And it also helps them out too. So it's a, it's a double, double, you know, factor. They can't probably afford to buy a house. So yeah. now they're in a house for a good, decent price. And then he always said too, that the renter's market, uh, isn't as volatile then you know, if you're, you know, in a downside market and the prices drop, you know, you, you usually your renters aren't getting a ton of uh, decrease in their rent. Anyway, right. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. you're not losing that. Um, but now we're taking you into a, like a couple more follow-up questions, my man here. Uh, what is one of your favorite meals after a long, hard day? What is one of your favorite meals you could sit down to? The yeah. Wife, so I feel in. I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in Hawaii. So to me, like soul oh, food, yeah. yeah, soul food is all about, you know, like, like, you know, uh, Kahlua pork or pork lala or yes. you know, uh, chicken katsu and, and, uh, and all these other, you know, Hawaiian spam. I love spam. Uh, I know I'm crazy. And people who listen to this are like, why the hell does this guy like spam? Well, yeah, you grew up on it. Yeah, I grew up in, I mean, that, that's the culture, man. So, uh, so I would say like anything Hawaiian, uh, after a long day is, is something that is like my, my perfect, perfect soul food. Uh, but also like, I also recently have been kind of going into the keto diet quite a bit. So I don't really get oh, the luxury of rice anymore, you know, right, right, right. <laughs> cutting the carbs, baby, cutting the carbs. Carbs. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, carbs are the enemy. Like, yeah, but I, it, it is, uh, I love keto so far. It's been really cool and it really has helped me quite a bit with, um, oh, yeah, absolutely. uh, food allergies and stuff. And, right. and also on top of that too, like, you know, I've, uh, uh, just recently, like a couple of weeks ago, I just did a 207 mile bike ride over the course. Oh, of wow. Yeah. Yeah. It w and it's, it's also, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't as like deep into keto when I was doing that. Cause you still need carbs obviously to like have energy to train right. and ride and stuff. But, but all in all, I mean, like I'm a lot healthier now than I used to be. And it's, and it's all entirely due to like, you know, being very strict with my food, but still of, of course, letting your hair down every once in a while is not a bad idea too. Yeah. You got to enjoy <laughs> life too, brother. You got to enjoy life. Whatever makes you happy, I think is the most important thing in your soul. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, however, obviously, yeah, we gotta live a happier life. Or you know, healthier. Try to cut, cut the stuff out that we don't need, and eat a you know more of a whole grain, a whole whole food type of life. Totally. Instead of all the box prepared stuff, it's hard too though. At, at the end of the day, so it's as an entrepreneur, it's the best thing you do is just you motivate yourself. You know, with mm -hmm. uh, what works best for you. But yeah, keto is legit, man. Yeah, one thousand percent. Yeah, it is definitely legit. I've lost uh, some serious pounds from it too, man, and and wow. I just love seeing that, that difference in the scale and the, my energy has gone up, which is crazy. Like in the very beginning, you feel like you're like you've just lost like half your IQ points, right? And you just can't focus, you can't think straight. You're like, man, this is the worst thing in the world. But once you actually get, once, it, you, get once you get the vibe going, dude, it's like you have more energy than you've ever had before, and you're like, how is this possible? I mean, I, and, and the reality is like your your body's using fat for fuel, and suddenly right. you're like, whoa, my brain's like a like a like a ship it's like a it's like you know skyrocketing into the atmosphere a bit and it allows you to focus in ways you couldn't do before when when you're like trying to digest a food baby and dying slowly at the same time you know right. so you car belly car belly and sugar totally. oh yeah for sure well one last question here if be real tonight for dinner you could sit down with anyone in the world for dinner who would it be Ooh, that's a good question uh i would probably say uh did that have to be living or dead it doesn't matter doesn't matter. Okay. I would probably want to sit down if, if anyone like right now at this point in time, probably with Jeff Bezos just to oh, nice. learn about his, what took him to get to Amazon. Uh, you know, like Bill Gates is a very close second. I actually really idolized Bill Gates growing up um, or even Lance Armstrong, you know, like I'd like to know what it was going through his head when he, when he was going through the doping stuff and all that sort of stuff. I'd like to, I'm, I'm genuinely very curious about um, a lot of different things, but, but yeah, I mean, Jeff Bezos alone, you know, he's in my backyard. He's in the same state I live in right. um, learning about, you know, where he left his, his very cushy, you know, financial job into starting Amazon and, Right. And, uh, and basically starting over and I've done that myself too. Like what was that fuel that got him going and stuff. And so that's probably who I'd pick for sure. I always love that. Uh, have you seen that one of those first photos where he's got like just a cardboard Amazon sign? 
Yeah, and he drove like a Nissan, like a, a not a, it was like a, a Honda Civic. I think he drove this green Honda Civic, even when he was like a multimillionaire in stock value, he still stayed humble. He still, you know, preserved his capital. And and like, look, you know, you don't become the most the most wealthiest human being on the planet by accident, right? right. And and especially like my dude went through a divorce and lost forty billion dollars, and he's still the richest dude in the planet. Like right. that is crazy when you think about that. So so, so yeah, like. A dude like him, that would that would be someone where I'd really like to learn more from from someone like him. Like, how do you scale? How yeah. the hell do you scale like this? How do you go from that cardboard box, you know, Amazon sign behind your desk, <laughs> driving a green oh, the Honda Civic, to being having the most expensive divorce of all time and still being the wealthiest person afterwards in the world? That's crazy. And Amazon trucks <laughs> everywhere now. There's le- you're getting less and less delivery from UPS and USPS. Oh, uh, but you know delivery. they got bullseyes on their back too, man. Like so, I watched John Oliver the other day, and John Oliver was talking about how uh, you know the the employees of of Amazon uh, at the warehouses and stuff have all these issues, and I'm like, oh, oh man, yeah, I mean, yeah, there, yeah, is, yeah. there is a price to pay, unfortunately, for like you know right. cheap stuff on the internet and having one day shipping now and stuff. But right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, w- with all that said, I mean, there's, you, you can't like Nike growing Nike sweatshops were a huge problem back in the day. Microsoft had anti- antitrust issues. Facebook, oh, you know, yeah. has, $5 has billion, dollars. $5 billion yeah. data, data, data $5 privacy. Billion with a B. That is nuts when you think about that. Right. right. And so I think, you know, the more successful you are, <laughs> well, okay. I, I don't know exactly which rapper said this. Uh, maybe it was actually too short, but someone said, uh, no, maybe it was Biggie. Mo money, more problems. They're totally. not lying. <laughs> totally. That's yeah. the hardest thing about business. And so, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's amazing to see how, how Jeff has uh, built something that has truly changed the world. And I think they're going to even go into more verticals. I've heard healthcare, all sorts of stuff. You might be getting your insurance from Amazon, Amazon yeah. health insurance, because they know all your data about what you eat and they know how healthy you are already. They got all these other pinpoints. They say Amazon has more data than any company in the world. Yeah, advertising is actually they're gonna really go. They're gonna big kill it. Yeah, advertising pretty soon as well. So I think that's that's another wave that's gonna be a pretty big Cash opportunity flow, for for, for a you, lot of us. for you, my man. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I, I think I think it, when it makes sense, yeah, I'll definitely go onto a new platform for sure. And and I think Amazon is 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 a a, a big opportunity in the future. Uh, I haven't had a lot of opportunities to really play with the platform or test anything out or whatever, but, but it is definitely on my radar and it's something that I want to jump into at, at some point in the future. Oh yeah. They're like the third largest, uh, advertiser right now and social media advertiser. Is it's, it really that much? Yep. Facebook, YouTube, Whoa. Amazon, Facebook, YouTube, Amazon. Uh, it, well, it, I, it's interesting that Snapchat's not in that equation anymore. Well, they had a good, they've been doing all right, but I mean, I think that this is the numbers are a lot bigger on Amazon. All yeah. The all well, the different audience stuff. is huge. Oh, yeah. It's huge, dude. Huge. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If and you can give I'll, our listeners, my man, one last real talk thought, what can you get, bring some knowledge from us? Look into the data, focus on the numbers and always let the data dictate your decisions. And if you don't know the data, you need to find other tools, platforms, or people that can help you find that sort of stuff. And where's the best place for people to find more information about you and your business? Uh, absolutely. So uh, you can find me on facebook.com forward slash action ads with a plural agency. I'm probably gonna have to fight the person who has action ad agency to the death to get that name back, unfortunately. But, uh, or you can find me on facebook.com forward slash Casey Carroll live, uh, C-A-S-E-Y-C-A-R-R-O-L-L live. Well, folks, you've been hanging out with Casey Carroll and Travis Tutalon Huff. I want to thank you again for your time today and let's keep being real. What's another epic episode and uh, if you enjoyed the episode today can you please do me a favor and subscribe to our podcast the be real show on itunes or your favorite podcast platform and also take a little time today if you don't mind and give your boy t huff a review i would really super appreciate it and thank you so much for listening today